in our everyday lives, we're exposed to a wide range of visual settings. And some of these settings might be a little bit distressing, and some of these settings might even make us feel a bit afraid. And some of these settings are actually quite beautiful, and they might make us feel really relaxed. So I was wondering, what if beautiful places actually had a quantifiable impact on our well-being? Um, but you can imagine that how do you measure um, the beauty of a space? It's not the easiest thing to do. And so for now, um, mainly we've had objective measures of the environment, which include um, the amount of green space in an area, whether an area has a lot of, um, say, woodland or freshwater, um, distance to parks, or also we've got measures of biodiversity. But this does not tell us if an area is beautiful. And so um, until recently, we've had very small scale kind of local studies looking at how the beauty of the environment might have an impact on our well-being. But we did, for, um, until recently, we have not been able to measure beauty on a large scale. So for example, imagine conducting a survey um, across a whole country. Um, it would be really time consuming and costly. Uh, luckily today, we have a new source of data on um, human behavior, and that's crowdsourced data. And using the internet, um, we can tap into hundreds and thousands of even millions of people and just ask them to do something. And if we make it fun, they'll do it for free. So I was really excited when I came across this really exciting source of data called Scenic or Not. And it uh, was a game created by my society. And it's a very simple game. And all you do is just rate these images between 1 and 10. And it's surprisingly quite addictive. Uh, but what's happening in the background is each image represents a square kilometer of the United Kingdom. Um, so by the time I came across this data, I had um, about 1.5 million votes um, covering 217,000 images and covering an area about around 95% of Great Britain. So this is uh, very exciting to find this uh, resource. Um, and if you look at how these uh, scenic ratings map out across all of England, um, you'll see that areas that people commonly like to go hiking, um, such as the Lake District or Somerset and Devon, they come out as being the more scenic areas. So from this little image, it seems like we are actually getting a message of where the beautiful areas are around England. Um, so in our first study, we wanted to look at whether scenic places actually have a quantifiable impact on our health. And for this study, we took data from the, the Census for England and Wales. And there's a question on the census uh, which asks how you feel about your health. And you, you answer, you know, I feel very healthy or not so healthy. And we took these answers and we, we um, quantified them across all of England to create average rates of poor health. And you'll notice right away that the cities are looking like they're not actually the most healthy places. So you can imagine that maybe there are other factors such as income that are playing a part in how we feel about our health. So um, with this study, we did look at a lot of other uh, measures that might um, help explain health. Um, so for example, we looked at income deprivation, employment deprivation, um, barriers to housing and services, air pollution, and also you can imagine that the countryside tends to be a lot more prettier than the city area. So we do take into account within areas urban, suburban, or rural. And so now we've got these two maps. So one is measuring um, average rates of poor health, and the other one's measuring average uh, scenic ratings. And again, we just we have all our other control variables, for example, like income and air pollution. Um, but there's one more thing we have to take into account. So if you look at the map, you'll see that there are measures are clustered together. And um, so something we do need to take uh, into account is spatial autocorrelation. And that's the same issue that you have with time series data, where um, so with spatial um, measures, you have measures that are nearby that might be um, um, related to each other. So we build a, co a conditional autoregressive model which takes this issue of spatial autocorrelation into account. So we're really excited. So after we take all, this, um, all these different um, issues into account, we're really excited that we found across all of England people do report better health when living in areas of greater scenicness. Um, so the question that we ha um, issue that we have is that we already know this about green space. So green space um, has been shown to be associated with um, well-being. So for example, green space is associated with more happiness, less mental distress, a better sense of community, crime deterrence, and also, yes, even better health. But there was this one study that I was really interested um, with this finding, is that they found um, that in low-income suburban areas, a higher quantity of green space is actually associated with worse health. So it does seem to be that possibly the quality of this green space does matter. 
So what we did is we looked at um, measures of green space across England and how that compares to measures of scenic ratings across England. And if you look particularly to the east of England, you'll notice that it's actually quite green, but it's not necessarily very scenic. So even though the two measures are significantly correlated, the effect size isn't very, uh, that high. So they do seem to be two different things. So what we did is then we created three models. So we got one model that only includes scenicness, and including all our other control variables, such as income and air pollution. And our second model only has green space, as well as our control variables. And our third uh, model has scenicness and green space. And as you can see in the bars, when we look at um, how this uh, works across all areas, as well as urban, suburban, and rural areas, the purple, which represents the scenicness, is coming out a lot stronger. So um, what this shows is that we can better estimate um, poor health um, using models that include scenicness rather than models that only include green space. So what's really interesting is that we're showing that there is something about the subjective experience of our environment that seems to play a role in how we feel about our health. Um, so the next question is, well, why are people reporting better health in these more scenic areas? So you can see, you can imagine that for, it might be that people are walking more. So if, a, if they have a nearby park that's really attractive, that might um, encourage them to, to maybe do more exercise. Um, but there's also that feeling you get when you go to a really beautiful area. You just, feel, you just feel relaxed. You feel happier. So maybe it could be a mental well-being connection. So in the next study, we actually looked at if scenic environments have a quantifiable impact on our happiness. And we used this uh, data from Mappiness, which was um, an app built by George McCarran. And it's a really fantastic app. Um, you basically get pinged uh, two times a day, and you're asked to report how happy, relaxed, or awake you are. And we're specifically looking at happiness in this study. Um, but you also answer some other questions about um, what's happening at the time. So for example, are you alone, or are you with your spouse, your children? And also various activities that you're doing. You know, are you studying right now? Are you doing shopping? Um, so it's a really a quite a rich source of data. And so the interesting thing about this data is we've got individual level data. So we can conduct a fixed effects analytic approach. And this is important because some individuals, they're always happy, and some individuals are always sad. And that can skew our results. So what we can look when we're doing a fixed effects approach is we can look at if an individual is happier when they visit a more scenic area. And the second thing that's really interesting about this data is that when people are paying to report whether they're happy or how happy they are, um, in the background, the app is actually um, checking which location you're in. So I can control for the things that people are typing into their app, so what activities they're doing and you know, if they're with their spouse or their children at the time. But because I've got that location data, I can control for a variety of variables, including, for example, the weather. I mean, we're always happy when it's sunnier. Um, also, I can look at medium household income, the amount of screen space in the area, and also whether an area is natural or built up. Um, so we do find that individuals are happier when visiting environments that are more scenic. Um, so this is really great, but I wanted to take it one step further. So um, in general, um, it's not that easy to make a natural environment even more beautiful. Um, unless you're a skilled gardener, of course. Um, but policymakers and urban planners, um, have, um, a, they can actually have a great um, impact on, on how uh, decisions they make related to how the aesthetics of a built environment. So I wanted to look specifically about whether these results held in built environments. And it turns out that it does hold for built environments as well. So the effect size, it's larger in general, but in built up areas, people are still happier when they visit more beautiful areas. So, um, so you might be asking now, well, what are these beautiful areas? You know, what are they actually composed of? And um, the question is that, well, beauty feels like it's a subjective uh, experience. Um, so, you know, you can imagine that social and cultural influences are going to shape the way uh, why we think an area is beautiful or not. Um, but there might also be um, a collective sense of beauty that we can measure, and this might have been shaped by our evolution. So there's two theories I find interesting, and one is um, the biophilia hypothesis, and that's um, talking about the fact that through evolution, we've built this innate connection to nature. And you can imagine that we might find attractive those things that aid our survival, for example, like fruit-bearing trees or climbable trees. 
Um, so there's a link between, you know, why, uh, possibly why we find nature so beautiful. But there's another interesting theory, and this is called prospect and refuge theory. And this is, um, this is from Jay Appleton, and he's saying that, that we have evolved to find a prefer outdoor spaces where one can easily survey prospects as well as uh, spaces that can, uh, one can find refuge. So um, the idea is that if, if there's a space um, where you can easily survey your dangers, then that might make you feel more relaxed and you might actually prefer those environments. So, so these are a few theories. How are we actually going to test these theories? So remember that I've got 217,000 images that have been rated 1.5 million times. Um, so I've got a really um, excellent source of data. And what I'm going to use is actually a convolution neural network because they've been proven to be amazing in computer vision tasks. Um, specifically using a convolution neural network called Places, which helps me extract two different things from my images. So I can put in all my input images, as you see. It runs it through um, this convolution neural network, and I can extract two things. I can extract uh, something called scene attributes, and it tells me um, the likelihood of there being um, clouds in the image, if it's an open area, uh, likelihood of being man-made elements in the image. And I can also extract place categories. So for example, with this image, you know, it comes out telling me that there's likely to be a skyscraper, a tower, or an office building. So, um, so I take all these images, and I look at now um, what are we getting as a characteristic of the most scenic images. And as you can imagine, there are things we definitely associate with beautiful landscapes. So we've got these beautiful mountain scenes, we've got these beautiful lake scenes, we've got abundant greenery, and also views that you can actually see to the distant horizon. Um, and unsurprisingly, the most unscenic images are images where you have um, more industrial um, elements, you know, like highways. But I am also noticing that if you have a drab green space, then that's also being rated as unscenic. And also, if you have a, like a beautiful field, but if you've got industrial objects in the distance, that's also being rated as scenic. And one more thing we looked at is what does scenicness mean in urban built-up settings? And you'll notice that, again, the, the first two images show some of the images do actually, actually represent our kind of ideas of the, the countryside. So you, you again get your beautiful water features, you've got like these gorgeous trees. But interestingly is we also get bridge-like structures being rated as scenic, as well as this historical building. So it's not as simple as just something being natural is beautiful and built up is ugly. The message seems to be more complicated than that. So what we wanted to actually quantify this. So what we did is we built up an elastic net model. And it's basically a penalized regression model which helps us do variable selection. And we looked at which variables it was actually picking out. So we do the most, like, like um, so we do get the message that natural elements, for example, like valley coast and mountain and ca natural canals and trees are associated with scenicness. And, you know, construction sites and parking lots and industrial areas are, um, you know, non-surprisingly associated with um, unscenicness. Um, but again, we get we had to see that there are these um, building types such as cottages and castles and towers that are also being picked up as being associated with scenicness, as well as these bridge-like structures uh, such as viaduct and, light, and, and aqueduct. Um, and and I also thought what was interesting is that grass is getting rated as being unscenic, and so grass and soccer field and athletic field these are um, scenes where you've got flat grass. And there might be something that if the grass doesn't have contours or you have green space that doesn't have trees, then that, that's not necessarily going to be considered as being scenic. And one, thing, one other thing that came out is the open area and no horizon is also coming out as, as not scenic. And I, as I talked about before with Appleton's theory, so um, a completely open area where you don't have a place to seek refuge might feel a bit unnerving, as well as if there's no horizon in the image, you could feel perhaps a bit claustrophobic, and that all, might also potentially um, also make it feel unnerving. So you might not actually think these scenes are actually very beautiful. So um, the next thing we wanted to do, so we're, we're kind of building up an idea that there is possibly a collective sense of beauty. So can we actually use that and predict the scenicness of images that we don't have crowdsourced um, ratings for? So you can imagine this is useful if you want to measure scenicness um, in an area where you don't have crowdsourced ratings for, or if you want to go at a higher resolution. So again, we go back to the convolutional neural networks. 
And I'm again going to be using the places um, CNN because it uh, was very useful before. And I don't, as I don't have that much training data, so I've got 217,000 images, but for a convolution neural network starting from scratch, there's not enough data. So, but what I can do is I can utilize the information that's already located in the places um, CNN. So I specifically use uh, Microsoft's residual network, which is a 152-layer network. And I, um, in essence, transfer that knowledge while I'm training it to now predict scenicness of an image. So basically, I take exactly the same network, but as opposed to predicting a place category like it was doing before, I'm asking it now to predict the scenic rating of an image. So, um, so I, I train our network, and now I look at um, how does it predict scenicness for images around London. So I took these ima uh, a, new, uh, a completely new data set, and these are images that people are uploading to a website called Geograph. And, um, and I look at how these uh, predicted scenic ratings uh, map out across London. And if you look, the parks are getting rated as being scenic. So parks that we, we like, such as um, Hampstead and, and Richmond Park, as well as Hyde Park, um, they're actually getting picked up as being rated as scenic. Um, and the city centre is also being rated as, as unscenic, because then you can imagine there's a bunch of built-up objects there. Um, it's lacking natural elements. But if you look closer, you'll also see there are some clusters in the built-up area that are being rated, picked up as being predicted as being scenic. And you've got things like, uh, when I identify where they are, it's Trafalgar Square and also the Tower of London. So um, it is also, this CNN is also able to pick up that built-up elements can also be um, considered to be beautiful. So if we take a closer look, so if I take the, the top 5% uh, um, predicted scenic images in London, I see, again, you've got your beautiful trees getting picked up as scenic, you get your um, water features as, uh, picked up as being scenic. And I thought it was really interesting that Big Ben and the Tower of London, two big um, well-known icons of London, as also getting picked up as being scenic. And if we look at the 5% uh, of images that are getting rated as the least scenic, um, you get your built-up um, industrial-looking areas containing a lot of built-up objects. Um, you get scenes where, so the one um, here is, again, that no horizon um, image where you, know, you feel a bit claustrophobic. You, you, know, you can see why that's rated as unscenic. But it's also picking up at these like, large areas of green space as being unscenic, and it's potentially because they're quite bland, they're flat. And they're also uh, uh, located next to a road, or they just look like they're not really well maintained. Um, so I just want to summarize that. Um, so across all of England, people report better health uh, when living in areas of greater scenicness. Um, individuals are also significantly happier when visiting areas that are more scenic. And the definition of scenicness is actually more complex than the simple what is natural is beautiful explanation. Um, Built-up areas can also be considered scenic, and natural features might not be scenic if they look flat and uninteresting. I want to leave you with one uh, important message today. So the next time you're passing by that beautiful bridge or passing by that beautiful meadow, take a good look at that beautiful view because your health and happiness might depend on it. Thank you.